This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Diagnosing the Aftermarket A to Z. I'm Matt Fonslow, and we have a real treat here. We have suckered Brian Pollock's wife into coming onto the podcast. And we're going to try to talk about what's maybe the same, what's maybe different, and what we can learn from an aircraft mechanic. But before we get going with that, wait a second here to hear from our sponsor, Napa Auto Tech Training. Napa Auto Tech offers three-hour virtual technical classes that can be accessed from the comfort of your home. To find out what courses are available, go to NapaAutoTech.com and click on the Napa Auto Tech class calendar link. All right, Alicia, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So I guess the first question everyone needs to know is how on earth do you put up with Brian? <laughs> <laughs> All depends on the day. Usually kick him out of the house. <laughs> I'm really known for my hard hitting questions. <laughs> no, not at all. Maybe a movie reference will be coming and then maybe what I'm known for. But I guess do you want to take a minute and explain exactly what you do for a living. I am a aircraft mechanic. I specialize in hydraulic actuators where I work ex- with experimental aircrafts that I have to make uh, actuators that they put in Learjet to make them feel when a pilot is flying them. They can make them feel like different aircrafts to help train pilots. We currently have an aircraft that we've been working on for five years. We finally got engines on it. Please tell me it's (laughs) SR-72. We can make them feel like a whole bunch of different things and test these pilots. Yeah, I heard of Eric's experimental aircraft and immediately the successor to the SR-71 Blackbird. Yep. (laughs) So let's just talk about that for the rest of the episode. (laughs) I guess, how did you get into it? How do you end up doing that? All started where I wanted to be an astronaut. However, my health would not allow that. I ended up going to school. You failed that test where they put you on that record player that goes around really slow. and No, I never even got that far. I would not pass a class A medical that you need to even become a pilot. Okay. So I went for aerospace engineering and found out I didn't want to sit and write manuals and work on a computer all day. So I tried different things, meteorology, business, and nothing was working. So I ended up switching over to aviation maintenance. I was going to an aviation school. I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, so high up there. And Once I got in the maintenance program, I knew that was the right fit for me and graduated with my associate's degree. I went back, started doing my business, uh, but then ended up meeting Brian and having a family. So that was put on the back burner and haven't quite finished that, but I don't know. (laughs) I'm wanting to go back now after so many years. But (laughs) How long is a program like that then, aircraft maintenance? Two years. If you went all the, or even took summer classes, it would, it's the two-year program. And Brian, you can jump in at any time. I don't know if I let everyone know Brian's here too. We've been ignoring him. I'm actually just sitting and listening and doing what I do best at home, which is shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Nope, this is about what she does. I'm excited. Her and I have a lot of conversation, particularly with the differences and what's involved and what we do. What's always been fascinating to me, talking to her about it has been the documentation end of things and how it is absolutely unacceptable to deviate from certain processes in which our industry, I'm sure, would break if we had to do that tomorrow or even in two years. When you go for aviation schooling, there's good six, seven months that you study just the fact of how to document everything, how things work out. It's called general with the aviation. It just goes over the basics of everything that you're going to be responsible for. What can happen if we don't use the right documentation, then you're more liable if something does happen down the road. As I was telling Brian, more than half our work is just the documentation alone. So we can do something that will take you five minutes, but then you got to document it, which 
will take 10 to 15 minutes just to do it. So you have to have the part numbers written down. You have to write what manual or documentation you followed to do that work and how it was done, what the problem was to begin with. Then you even have to have an inspector come and double check your work on top of that to make sure it was done properly. Something as easy as what changing out the batteries take a good half hour, 45 minutes to do. I might have to back this up just a little bit. You go to school for aircraft maintenance. So what I think about is in auto repair, we have, for the most part, automobiles, light trucks, and and a lot translates back and forth. But then we have multiple, multiple, multiple car lines, manufacturers, and okay, a wheel's a wheel and, and stuff like that. Fundamentally, brake pads are brake pads, but you start getting into certain areas and there's different names, maybe different ways of going about certain things. In some cases, completely different systems, completely. For your training, was is that something that kind of goes across the board all the way from, say, I, I don't know, like a Cessna up to a, we'll just say like for sake of discussion, an airliner? When we first start with the general, you start where everything's got the wheels, everything's got engines, everything's got hydraulics, everything's got cable tensions, everything. So you start with the basics with everything's got at least this or that. And then as you go through after general, then you'll do the airframe, where is everything but engines on an aircraft. And then you will have a separate component, which is just the power plant. Anything that deals with the engines is a completely different category. So, because every aircraft has different engines. So you get the reciprocating engines, you get the turbo fan, you get the turbo, you get with all these different engines that takes up a whole separate thing. There's even a small section that goes over in the airframe of going with aircrafts that are made out of cloth, which they touch on, but don't go into major details because you don't see many of them anymore. Yeah, you'd be working on restoration more so than that would be old, old stuff. Yes. Yeah. See, in our training, we skip over all that. I wonder if they even, I don't know that they teach carburetors or distributors. That's one of the things we learn in airframe is carburetors. Power plant. Did you learn that in power plant or airframe? No, that is power plant. Yeah, that's power plant. Power plant. Probably uh, you guys learned magnetos. Magnetos. They don't have. Power plant. They don't have really distributors. Yeah. No, there's no distributors. I know magnetos, but now your first job was actually working on jet engines that had nothing to do with flight, right? I started out with T-55s. We got them from old military warehouses and we grabbed them, we cleaned them up, ran them and then put them in frack machines after we beefed them up. So they were never airworthy. For like sand fracking? Yes. I think of it as like silica sand. Yeah. There's something else you did with those. Oh, converted them to run on natural gas, right? Correct. Yeah. I'm trying to think like where the deviation really starts with, can you work on an airplane without some sort of credentialing? No, you can, but you have to work under somebody who can sign off for you. If you don't have your A&P mechanics license, then you have to be working under somebody that does. Because then they have to sign off your work. Is that a one-time deal? Yeah, because it's through the federal government. Once you get it, you have it unless you either get suspended or you turn it in and don't want it anymore, which I don't understand why people would do that. But Now, I think, Alicia, you've told me, though, if how does it work when you're off for more than a certain amount of time? Aren't you back on probation again? Correct. So you have to work for two years If you stop working within two years, then you go back to being green is what they call it. And then you have six months of probation where you cannot do anything without having an IA check off your work for you. And then once you get to after six months, if you've done that procedure, you don't have to have so much as an IA 
checking off your work. However, most places and companies still have an IA double checking your work so that nothing is missed. I know they at least do that with the company I work with. However, if you are just a small mechanic working on somebody's Cessna for them, you don't have to have an IA unless it's an annual inspection. So you can do the service work on it. Correct. Maintenance or whatever, but once a year, it's got to go in and get inspected by somebody that's credentialed. There's a 100-hour inspection. There's a 500-hour, 300-hour inspection. There's all these different levels of inspections that a A&P can do alone, but then there's higher inspections that only an IA can do that an AMP cannot, which an IA is just an AMP who's had extra schooling and that they have to go and test so many years. And when I think of that, it's, is that like the X-raying the airframe or is it even deeper than that? It's deeper than that. It's just more or less of checking people and how they're doing stuff, but it's with power plant and airframe. They like disassemble the whole thing when they do some of those inspections, right? Oh, yeah. You guys just had to send some engines out to have that inspection basically done and pretty much bill it as a rebuild because of such an in-depth inspection. Like there's no way you're going to take that much apart and not replace wear items, right? Yeah. After so many hours, certain engines need to be overhauled. First, they might get reworked and then to a point they have to get overhauled, which is just a different level of maintenance that needs to be done. But in our facility, we don't have anybody that can do that. So we send all our engines out. Is there a point or a threshold where it becomes, starts to get to be unreasonable for one of the technicians or mechanics to be a nose to tail mechanic that they will service a plane nose to tail? On smaller aircrafts, yes. But the bigger airline, usually you have sets of teams that will take care of that stuff. That's right. They specialize in certain, you have a hydraulic team of this team of that team. Yeah, because you had mentioned that you were specialized or focused a lot on the hydraulics. And is that just hydraulics throughout the plane, like the landing gear, the flaps, everything? No, I specialize on the special components that our company uses alone. Nobody else makes these hydraulic components. So I specialize in those. Yeah. And then... We have other mechanics that do the daily maintenance. We have other mechanics that are doing the redesigns of the aircrafts when we first get them. Then we have avionics technicians that only do the wiring. So mechanics don't have to know that high of electronics. And then you usually have a power plant team. My company is on the smaller side, so us A&Ps usually have to do both. And then I know we even have a set of machinists that do all the special machine work and or fabrication that we need throughout the aircraft line. I think that's pretty much it. And then we have our safety team as well. For our shop specifically, and I think Brian's to a degree, that we, we try to have tech specialize in certain areas. My guys really don't have to know a lot about wiring, electrical, diagnostic processes, stuff like that. And then one might do more kind of powertrain than another. And then another one's maybe more under car, but they'll do that across all car lines. So yeah, the documentation is like, we can't not talk about that. Our documentation is, we just say what we did. And sometimes it it can be essentially click from the labor guide. You know what I mean? Like if we do a brake job, a front brake service, it really on the invoice says remove and replace calipers, replace pads, replace the rotors, reassemble, torque lug nuts to specification, test drove and verified repair. Something to that degree. But the level of your documentation, I'm guessing, is much more detailed. To a point where you have to reference where you're getting your documentation from, the hour in which it's being on the aircraft, parts you're using. So you have to have serial numbers, part numbers. And then it's also got to be signed off with your signature, your AMP certification number. 
it just makes me think, Matt, do you remember those those older Nissan 3.5s? And if sometimes if you got coils, if you got a set of coils that weren't all the same lot number, it would set that, set that stupid igniter code. In my head, I imagine having to write the lot number of each coil you installed down every, but every single thing that she does. And like, you can't just say, oh, I torqued the lug nuts. This is what I torqued them to. And this is where I found that specification at. And this is what time it was when I did it. Like, isn't that, do you understand what I mean by how it would break? It would break our industry so bad. Like we would never be able to do that. If we go back to the mechanic servicing the Cessna, not picking on Cessnas, but I'm sure there's more of the private small aircraft, two seaters, four seaters, probably turboprops. Do they document that as well? Do they, are they expected to document to that level as well? Or is Maybe not ex- expected to, but if they don't, the repercussions are terrific. Yeah, everything needs to be documented at all times, even on the littlest aircraft, even more so with the Cessnas because they're usually privately owned. Like a pilot can do some mechanic work, like they can change a tire. However, we never recommend pilots to change a tire because most of them would have no idea what they're doing with it. And then that would cause issues down the road. But that way, it's got to be documented of how much pressure they put in the tire. What type? Is it air? Was it nitrogen? What were they using? What manual were they using? What part number, part illustration did they use? What were they torquing to? Some documentation, they even have to know which torque wrench you used so they can go back and make sure that was in calibration and up to date. Does that make sense? I guess part of it is like there's this idea of if something fails on an airplane, spells imminent doom, which isn't necessarily the case. And the frequency of things with an airplane or especially personal are fewer than like inter- with cars. Like we drive our cars every day, multiple times a day. We have way more interactions with other cars and people and all that. Stuff falls off cars all the time and they just pull over. And it's not to blow off safety with an airplane, but it's like there's that stigma of I absolutely don't want anything to go wrong with my airplane. And yet when you're coming in for a landing, it's not like there's a whole bunch of other obstructions to worry about other than the pavement. And depending on what fails, might suck, but you're not taking out people on the sidewalk or... No, just flocks of birds. Another vehicle, stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Sully. (laughs) But we don't do anything like that. And I was thinking about just what Brian was saying with coils and the lot number, but we register fuel injectors with numbers to be written into the module. And we might say we did it, but we don't keep track of those numbers and we don't document or replace tires. A lot of times there's no documentation about date codes. We might look at date codes as a maintenance. Do you imagine to reference the manual that told you the process for changing the wheel and tire assembly, Matt? (laughs) Could you imagine? Yeah, I'm just thinking about that. And then there's no way, man. And our maintenance books actually go, they travel around with the aircrafts. Each aircraft has got their own sets of books that have to be on the aircraft at all times. So when they fly from destination to destination. Is that a glove box that they want more room? They just Usually it's hidden under some kind of seat or some kind of pocket off to the side. But there is usually a huge stack of documentation that flies with the aircraft at all times with certifications, the maintenance records of what's been done, when it's been done, what needs to be done next. Each aircraft is traveling with its own all data DIY subscription, essentially, right? Yeah. You got Each one has its own personalized. So it'd be like instead of we're working on a 2015 Chevy Suburban and walking over to the computer to pull up you name it, you flip the back seat up and and there it is like a big Rand McNally Atlas, just like all these papers and documentation all cataloged and they keep it in binders, right, Alicia? Yes. Now, like the little details that stays at our company, but any maintenance records saying we completed the 300 hour inspection, this day with this much work has been done, what's been touched, what hasn't been touched, And that all flies with the aircraft every time it leaves. I'm guessing the book doesn't 
have like a wiring schematic where there's a choice between something absurd. I don't know. It's a two seater or a four seater that this is that aircraft's manual. There's no, you're not choosing anything. Did this come with a Motorola or did it come with a NVIDIA or or something like that? Yeah. It's basically the manual for that serial numbered aircraft, right, Alicia? Correct. Okay. Car manufacturers don't do this. No. You go to the factory service information and it's asking you building codes, RPO codes. Does it have brake system JL4 or not? Right. What options did it come with? Does it have a eight inch driver's information center or does it have a 4.4 or none? Is it monochrome? Is it colored? Yeah. Automatic air conditioning or manual heated seats. Yeah. There's all that stuff that these maintenance manuals are very specific about. Wow. That by itself would be so nice. I'm thinking even if every car, essentially you punch the VIN in and maybe a a passcode of some sort and then boom, there it is. This is the service manual for that car. We do have that, Matt. I don't think that we think about it in the aftermarket at all, but uh, as much as people like to pick on Ford, Oasis, if that thing's serviced at the dealer service center, you hook the scan tool up to that thing and you click the read button, PTS, and you get open service actions that thing has. If you're on the dealer side, you get every time that vehicle VIN number has ever been in a Ford service facility, you get the repair order number and the story. A friend of mine showed me Chrysler Dealer Connect and looks somewhat, it doesn't look like Oasis, but it does a lot of the same things. Where it follows VIN number and you can see exactly what they did to that specific car. Yeah, if it's been serviced at a dealer. I mean, he showed me a while ago, so maybe it's better. That's the thing. It's only serviced at a dealer. It's not like her Learjets and Gulfstreams are going back to the Learjet or Gulfstream dealer. She's the independent service facility. How awesome would that be? And then we're just talking about taking something apart and putting it back together and documenting. How about how about like a diagnostic situation where I'm going to make something up and probably really show you how little I know, but... Let's just say customer has a, a nicer Learjet. It's a electro hydraulic. One of the flaps for takeoff doesn't work on the left side or the, I don't know how they even, you can't say driver's side because a lot of times there's, it can be on either side, right? We'll just say on the, the left side. In my world, I can look at a wiring schematic. I might look over a flow chart, maybe read a description operation of the system. And then I'm going to come up with my own way to figure out do I have a wiring issue back there? Communication, if there's some sort of a module back there that's really in charge of the hydraulics, I'm going to use a lab scope, a, a digital storage oscilloscope to look at communication. And we have external scan tools that plug into a data link connector that gets onto that network and can talk to various modules. And I can look at data and maybe I can see that that module back there doesn't even know it's being asked to lower that flap. Is that kind of how that works for you guys? You just have to document what you do and have it signed off? Yes, and how you came to the conclusion of why it's that component. Okay, there isn't like a protocol of, in this situation, this isn't working. This is step one. This is step two. This is step three. You can come up with your own process as long as you document it and explain how you got to where you got. Correct. You can document The steps that you take now, like automotive, where they give you the charts of what it could be. But again, they don't work there either, Matt. They don't work the same way. (laughs) Supposed to say they work awesome and that we need to step up our game. You're sitting here talking about trying to diagnose something. Uh, Just before I left work this weekend, we had an aircraft that was supposed to take off Thursday afternoon. Towed the plane outside and the heat wasn't working. They towed it back in, and even after, by the time I left on Friday, they still couldn't diagnose of why the heat wasn't working in the aircraft. After we have just did a 300-hour inspection on this aircraft, we changed engines, we did a whole bunch of testing, and it was too... They got two lines reversed. That's what they thought. Something with the pressure, and they still couldn't get the heat on. The pressure was right. They were almost thinking... We got a crack team that they want to fly us in. Yeah, they ended up putting in a new whole electrical system and computer system in this aircraft within the last two months. And it was 
the higher ups were trying to force it out faster than it should have been. We got everything turned around, but they're pretty sure it's an electrical issue of why the heat's not turning on. However, the special electrical team that we hired to come in was no longer on site and they weren't sure where to go. So it was supposed to leave no later than today. However, I'm not sure if it left or not. By the way, they were going on Friday. It was not looking good. They're going to get a one-star Google review. (laughs) Yes, they are. (laughs) Not going to be good on Yelp. I guess I'm somewhat stunned that they would allow that kind of freedom. I thought it would be a lot more structured that this is the path. And if that doesn't work, then you have to call up the manufacturer tech support and then come up with a new plan. But they don't want you freelancing how to figure out what's wrong, even though you might be more than capable. In a way, that's neat to hear that you can, as long as you document it, you can uh, come up with your own diagnostic uh, process or strategy as long as you get to the culprit. Yeah, the documentation is more or less of why you share the point of changing a component and to make sure you installed it correctly. Because if you didn't and then the aircraft went down because of that component, then you become liable for that accident and even can get charged with manslaughter. There's a death because of it. The onboard diagnostics, is that all really on board, like all through a display in the plane? With our aircrafts, yes. But most aircrafts, no. Like your Cessna, if not a glass cockpit, it won't have any of that. The only thing that will be tracking anything would be your black box, which would track, again, what the height was when you lost control or what component was doing what, but not the details that you would need it for. Is it that they're just not that uh, complex, like they're not using networks? Correct. Okay. There'd be nothing to plug into. They're not worried really about emissions, so they're probably still carburetors? For some aircrafts, yes. I know usually on your Cessnas, you're still using carburetors. For our Learjets, you're not. You have the gas module that takes care of that. But with like our aircrafts, we have built-in VSS systems that we can plug anything into them to mimic aircrafts. And we can even do stuff from the ground where other aircrafts you can't do that with. I'm not sure with the whole jetliners of what their capability is. I just know with the smaller aircraft, they're not that high tech. For 98 years, the Napa name has meant quality parts and service. It also reflects top quality training programs to help you build a more successful vehicle repair business. No doubt, the technician shortage is impacting everyone, but you're not facing this battle alone. Napa has the solution by making Napa Auto Tech training available near you. Napa Auto Tech provides automotive aftermarket technicians career development opportunities through structured, disciplined, measured, and high-quality technical instruction, no matter the technician or service advisor skill level. This instruction enhances understanding of vehicle systems, increases first-time repair capability, and overall customer satisfaction. It also prepares technicians to become ASE certified. It's a fact technicians who receive training to improve their knowledge and skills have a higher sense of job satisfaction. This reduces technician turnover and increases productivity, directly improving a shop's profitability. It is vital to the success of a shop's business that today's technicians are equipped to diagnose and repair today's complex vehicles. With our ever-changing technology, the technician's knowledge and skills need to be updated and refreshed on a regular basis. As you labor over the decision of whether to send your techs to get their skills sharpened, keep in mind, Napa Auto Tech training is an investment, not an expense, and it's available to all. Much of Napa Auto Tech's training is offered in more than one format to accommodate varieties of learning styles and training preferences so each person can maximize their learning. Whether you're more of a hands-on person or enjoy learning at your own pace, Napa Auto Tech is here to provide you with the training you need and the format that works best for you. To learn more about what Napa Auto Tech offers, contact NapaAutoTech.com. The few times I've been on a plane when, they, when they've had to do something, it's what, from what I could see, it was all through the displays in the cockpit and based off maybe a warning light. They truly have onboard diagnostics. They call ours onboard diagnostics, but it's really not. If you don't have something to interface, you're not doing any diagnosing. 
unless it's a 92 Chevy pickup and you're going to count the check engine light blinks or something, right? Or a whole Chrysler, you cycle the key. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't have onboard diagnostics, even though we call it OBD2. Cadillac, off and warmer. Yes. Through the climate control. I just had to do that on an Eldorado. I can't remember how long ago. You could get codes. You could look at some data. It was hard to look at, but you could do it. It was like staring at data on a calculator. A <laughs> <laughs> speak and spell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, man, I feel old. Oh, man. So does anybody get to test out the ejection seats? Is that what you get to do that? That <laughs> seems somewhat hydraulic. Actually, those are bungee cords. <laughs> oh, yeah. You were just talking about the bungee cords this morning at breakfast. Yes. I just thought if they had to replace stuff like that. For us, if we replace airbags that haven't blown, we're supposed to set them off and so they can be properly disposed. And I thought maybe you guys replace some seats and they have ejection. So they got to go blow them off. And the responsible thing would be to... If they were pulling ejection seats out, I would have one, one strapped to a go-kart. That's not fun. <laughs> yeah, I was amazed the one day because she'd always talked about documentation. And I was talking about something and just telling her, man, it, it just stinks. Our flow charts are so inaccurate. As soon as you go to a flow chart or whatever, you're, if you do fix the vehicle, it's going to take you too long. And there's a good chance that you won't. And she's like, oh, yeah, ours aren't no good either. And I'm like, wait, what? Stunning, right? Yeah, they even told you that in school, right, Alicia? Yeah. Your diagnostic instructor guy said pretty much you can go ahead and throw that out the window. This is for reference, but if you're going to try to, yeah, you can pretty much wipe your rear end with it. That's about all it's good for. I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't know how important it is, but I guess I want to know, like, is this something, do you guys talk about CAN bus, LIN bus, flex ray, just serial data? They got their own kind of a protocol probably be more the electrical team right alicia yes that would deal with communication issues like that yeah yeah that would be our avionics team avionics that's what i was trying to get out avionics technicians that's like the mobile guy matt that's like calling the mobile guy it's calling the avionics technician over yep back to that idea with the flap where it's it's hydraulic the hydraulic ain't working isn't working and whatever's controlling the hydraulics solenoids aren't working because of a module and if that's something she's going to look into or, or you're going to look into that back there i don't know stabbing wires <laughs> it's to a point i've had to work with the avionics team when one of the hydraulic actuators was sitting there and pulsating oh yeah it was having a seizure right yeah it was trying to fly like a seagull please tell me if that pulse sent you phil's probe oh no she doesn't have a Phil's probe. I feel like she needs one. <laughs> Paul, if you're listening to this. I have one in my truck, honey. I can get you one. I'd buy you like three more, but there's some guy with a YouTube channel that buys them all and gives them away. Except to the people that would use them like me and you. Yeah. And I'm not even looking for a free one, Paul, if you're listening. I'm just looking for the opportunity for them to be in stock at AES Wave. That's all I'm looking for. I'll even buy them from you, Paul. Sitting at his cabin, loathing his Steelers loss right now. Oh, no, they did. Oh, yeah, they got killed. I haven't been paying attention. But it was one of those points where it was between me and the electronics guys. And they're like, well, it's an electronic issue. And it, to find out it was differential pressure transducer, I installed it backwards. So it was literally sending the signal backwards. And they're like, it was our issue. And it was like, nope, that's mine because it's mechanical. So I had to fix the component. But it was one of those, if it's on the actuator, it's my problem. If it's from the component on towards the aircraft, then it will be the electrical guys that would have to look into it. So it was just one of those things up there like, let's cross line. Maybe we have our lines backwards. Let me double check to make sure everything was installed right and to find out I installed it backwards because that was in a hurry. I was like, yep, definitely not going to work right. Everyone listening, that would be similar to a DPFE on a fork. Yes. What was interesting when she told me the story about that is the piece that was installed incorrectly, A, it can be installed incorrectly. It doesn't, it can be installed upside down or right side up for lack of better terms. So it's not like there's a bolt pattern that prevents incorrect installation. And the way you know you have it installed correctly is if you cannot see the serial number or the part number. <laughs> she goes, oh, yeah. Because you asked one of the guys that was in there, right? You're like, can you see their serial number? Yeah. Yeah, I asked. He was like, yep. You're like, okay, it's got to come out. It's backwards. And they were like, what do you mean it's backwards? Yeah. 
So what you're saying is the same designers work in the auto repair industry. We're not sure which ones, I shouldn't say auto repair industry, in the automotive industry. So they just go design planes for a while and then... They're probably the same people, man. Well, most of our stuff is to a point where you can't interchange. They make lines different sizes so that you can't mix them up. This is just one component that because my company makes it, the engineer who designed it did not design it to have a a different way so you couldn't mix it up. But luckily, it's also a component that it's not going to hurt the plane to fly without it. Worst case scenario, I could take it off the actuator and it would fly perfectly fine. It was just for the fact of it was installed backwards that it wouldn't run correctly. Yeah, about that lining, we got things called reducers. We make those lines fix fit no problem. So how many times have you seen the wrong plug smashed into the wrong component? I'm like, how hard did this person try to do this? Like I have like pretty good hands and like I've been pulling on a plug so hard that was smashed into a component. Like I was seeing spots trying to separate it. The guy had the plastic smashed so hard. What are you doing? Or that the parts stores should really stop selling razor blades because they'll just, they'll slice those. The notches? Yeah. Notches or guides or whatever. Slice that bad boy right off. Yeah. I have a couple old GM harnesses up in the attic and I have every plug for every GM you've ever needed between those harnesses and a razor blade. It'll make you whatever you want. (laughs) The other thing that I've found interesting, at least about Alicia's job, and I, I don't think that this is like this everywhere where they they work on planes but with what she does they actually have engineers on site daily that she has to work with which is would be like us working with engineers there's friction sometimes could you imagine me working with a couple of engineers in our shops man i did i ha- i had a mental image of like which wwe wrestler was i that's exactly where i was going with that yeah me like choke slamming somebody probably yeah pain or somebody one of those backstage segments in the <laughs> arena, Kane kicking the door in, finding Mr. McMahon there. Shot to the solar plexus and a choke slam On the desk. As some engineers <laughs> are easier than others, that is for sure. That is the exact thing. That's where I was going with that. <laughs> Matt and I have done too many of these. I knew <laughs> yeah. he was going there. It's either great minds think alike or fools never differ, but. Yeah, right. We're definitely on the same wavelength. But yeah, I thought that was interesting that she has to work with engineers on a daily basis. And I'm like, I have through some of the things I've gone through in my career and some networking, I absolutely have friends in engineering in Detroit, but it's certainly not available to John Q technician in our field. That's for sure. Right. So I thought that was pretty interesting that she has direct access to the engineers that are working with these things. I I thought that was pretty neat. When I first started working with the company, I had my own engineer that I worked hand in hand with until he switched jobs just this past December, which kind of threw me in a loop. But it's one of those things with working with these engineers. Hopefully you get to work with a good one. Occasionally you get one that you just don't see eye to eye with, which makes it a lot more difficult trying to get things fixed the way they need to be. How did you choose hydraulics? Was that something early on or is it really like this job specific? That was what the opening was or? To be honest, I got into hydraulics when I started working with a company called Moak. I was working with them on components for the A350 before it was even released. That's the airliner, right? It is. We were making these special hydraulic components that were two, three feet big, if not bigger. Some of them were already up to four feet. And I was building them almost in a manufacturer type style. And what's manufacturing? I know you were doing a lot of soldering and wire crimping, right? Because we were laying in bed one time and she rolled over and at three in the morning, under her breath, she goes, pass me the crimpers. 
And I like woke up and I said, I don't know what that means, but you're not getting any players in this bed right now. <laughs> That's not happening. But she was like, she was like having a dream about crimping wires on. Crimper could be better than strippers. And if she'd have said strippers, you'd have probably got the wrong idea initially. Yeah, she wasn't getting anything. I was like, nope, not happening. And that's how I actually got into hydraulics. I wasn't even working with my AMP license at the time because I was working under the manufacturer. I loved doing it other than I didn't like the hours that I was working. When I was offered the job that I have now, it was, they're like, oh, you'll fit perfect into the hydraulics. And once I started, I fell in love with them. The components hydraulic actuators I'm working on now are a lot smaller than I was working with Moog, but just the hands-on and working with the smaller components is very interesting to me because the tolerances are so small that I work with. So what kind of fluid do they use? Would it be something similar to our transmission fluid? I work with 56, what is it? 5356 mineral spirits. Or not mineral spirits, mineral. Mineral oil or. Yeah. And then I know with our Gulf Stream, they're with SkyDraw. And when I worked with Moog, I worked with the SkyDraw, which is a lot rougher of a hydraulic fluid. Not ideal to work with, but the mineral oil that I use today is a lot gentler. Yeah. I mean, it's borderline baby, baby lotion, baby oil. Probably. It does wonders on your hand if they're ever dry. So We use it to make smoke to test for leaks. Okay. We burn it. Heat it up on a heating element. Get it really hot. Then mix it with nitrogen or carbon. I'm on carbon dioxide now. I'm using CO2, but either way, mix it. I live on the wild side. I use atmosphere. Oh boy, you dangerous man. Do you know why I started using CO2, Matt? Because I can use my ATS leak detector ah. along with my smoke machine. That makes sense. Yeah. I have forming gas. I don't have CO2. I use forming gas for high pressure leak detection. Gotcha. Mainly nitrogen with a just a hint, hint of hydrogen. Just gives it a little flavor, a little bit of little bit of pizzazz. A little bit of zip. Yep. A little zip. A little zip. Not bad aftertaste. Another thing that's interesting when Alicia talked about tolerances, not only do they have super tight tolerances, but she actually does bench testing of those components they have a giant because I've, I've seen like a picture of it it takes up like half the wall hydraulic mule <laughs> yeah hydraulic mule that they like hook up to this thing and they they like stress it out for like hours at a time trying to break it which i think is pretty cool but yeah what are your tolerances like in the bore of that component alicia is it like three ten thousand i don't know you told me it's it's like stupid small. Yeah, it's down to actually, I think you're correct, three ten thousandths. Three ten thousandths. What are you measuring? That the, like you're not using, pla- can't you really use a plastic gauge? No, I use a bore gauge. Micrometer on. They have yes. super expensive bore gauges. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking the tolerance is for roundness has to be within that tolerance? Yeah, because I have a honing machine that I have to hone out these bushings. So that the piston and the bushing tolerance is so close so that a minimal amount of oil can get through. So we're not talking about like ball thingy. It's not like when you and your dad repacked hydraulic cylinder in the dirt. (laughs) Out in the middle of the field. (laughs) It's not like this. It's very. I was thinking like a cylinder hone with the little, I don't even know what the technical term is for that. Yeah, a ball home where it's just got the little dangly balls. Yeah, the little dingleberries. I don't think it's like that. They have the deal where it can, the honing machine can sense the difference in diameters as it travels in and out of that piston stroke. It's a pretty big deal. And then they measure it. When you measure for leakage, Alicia, it's not like external leakage, but they can actually measure how much blow by that piston has, for lack of better terms. They can measure the blow by. And that's spec is. I don't know. She's told me all about it. And I'm like, how do you even make that work? Yeah, there's the internal leakage I test for and the external leakage I test for. The external is more or less an eye of how much is leaking out. Usually if there's a little bit within a two hour period, we just let it go. If 
like gushing out oil, it automatically needs new seals. The internal leakage, depending on the temperature at which I am testing it at or just regular testing, usually I can only have what it, it's 14 milliliters per minute. At 1500 PSI, right? Yes. Yeah, at 1500 PSI, 14 milliliters. And she has a machine that you can put it in to basically freeze it, Alicia. You can. Yeah, I freeze it to negative 90 degrees. I mean, that was today, so you could just throw it outside. <laughs> <laughs> then I have to run it. And after that, then we test the amount of leakage for that. That one, we're only allowed two milliliters per minute. However, usually if it's a good actuator, you won't even get a drop out of it. I was going to say, it's like rarely ever, eh, is that good or bad? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's good or... It's either good or, yeah, you're starting over again. Do these stroke really end to end or, or close? Or will they be somewhere in between and they have a very high traffic wipe area or sweep area that wears? And then you would, of course, find that. You can probably hone it out only so far. And then do they just, the cylinder itself, is there a, a single cylinder portion that you replace or is it pretty much, it gets a whole new unit? Usually so far that I have found that needs to be replaced are just the seals, which are right after the bushing. So if you have the head of the actuator, then you'll have the seals and then the bushing and then the piston itself. And the bushing and the pistons usually don't wear. The only time you'll see any kind of wear is if one side is rubbing a little more than the other, but it doesn't cause any more leakage than when you started. The internal leakage usually doesn't change any. However, the external leakage is what shows up. So I need to replace the seals. Then I'll have component wear. On our Moog valve that we use, that has started to show wear after 20 years, where their seals are starting to leak. So we'll send them out to get those replaced. Other than that, most of the other components are within 30, 40 years before they start to show wear, which the actuators I currently work with, some of them are 40 to 50 years old. And then we just made six brand new ones, which the difference between them, you wouldn't know the difference other than one might have a head seal that leaks a little more than the other. This is fascinating stuff. My memory of RAM stuff was, I was pretty, <laughs> pretty young yet. And it was all farm implement stuff, load, front end loaders, the RAMs on like the round balers and the hay binds and plows and some of the more fancy drags and discs i guess the heads on combines and they had to, they'd pull the rams apart and they'd add these cups like layers they call them cups they, in the bottom right yeah at the end of the piston and then at the end of the cylinder you had the the seal which we called the packing right we used to repack the cylinder and it had that big nut on the end of the cylinder that you'd call like three of your buddies up and go buy a piece of 10 foot exhaust pipe and a pipe wrench and go hang off it and try to get it apart. And Literally. It was like impossible to get apart. They insisted they needed my help, even though I weighed, weighed maybe 70 pounds. But <laughs> yeah, I think this is a lot more precise than what you and I have dealt with based on what I've heard. And then the documentation she does on those testing results even is it's documented on paper, it's documented on computer, it's documented on computer where anybody in the company can go pull it up. And even though she specializes in that, like some days she doesn't touch a hydraulic actuator. Some days it's 100%. What were, what were you doing the other day, Alicia, putting panels back on an airplane or something like that? They had a part. We have an aircraft that we've been working for the five years and with them just installing the engines, I had to put all the external panels back on so we could run the test run these engines and to do that I was told to install panels quick not even install them all the way just put a couple of screws in tack them in make sure they're not going to go anywhere so I literally had to document each panel that 
was just tacked on for testing purposes so that we can remove it and then redocument when we do go install them correctly. It almost have to be an agreement with all our shop management systems to report to some third party, which I suppose Carfax to a degree, but then bump up the level of documentation of exactly what was done, how this was arrived at. It's hard to picture shops doing that. It's just so hard. It would kill 90% of shops out there. It would absolutely kill them. I was just talking to somebody, was talking about this the other day. I was on a Zoom meeting and they were talking about specifically about government involvement in aircraft and how they, we wish we had that. I go, I don't know if you want that. Think that takes the labor rate to the point where the middle class is done driving cars because you're going to start getting into quadruple labor rate of what we have now. You're going to get into a six to $800 per hour labor rate to do that. Alicia, any idea what the labor rate is at the FBO at the, at the, Oh, I have no idea. Would you even be able to guess? Is it probably a thousand dollars an hour to get an airplane worked on through the FBO maybe, or just absolutely no idea. Yeah. Just absolutely no idea. They're a part of my company, but they're not. Yeah. They're, they're separate cause they're doing, Yeah, she's doing internal work and the FBO does. They're like the shop. They have like customers. Like if you have a private jet, And you fly into the Niagara Falls airport and your private jet is broke. It goes to the FBO, right? Pretty much, Alicia, that's how it works. Correct. Yeah. The thing is, if they say it needs to get done, what are the chances? You're like, eh, can we wait? Can you get the AC working first? And then maybe I'll come back and... I'll come back and get my door bolts torqued (laughs) too soon. So how does that work, Alicia? If there's an airplane that has, that's in for an inspection and it has a mechanical defect... That's not an option for them to wait, right? They either do it or the air, look at the face she made. No. She goes, no. They either do it or your plane doesn't fly anymore. The aircraft's grounded until further notice. Wow. Somebody brings a car to our shop that is completely unsafe. There is nothing we can do about them taking the car from the shop. We're almost better off if they're not going to do the work and we deem the vehicle unsafe that we don't even let them take it. We demand they tell us where to have it towed and we tow it there us tow it there and drop it yes and document it like we find it so unsafe we hired a towing company we did not allow the customer to take it yet because it could be a wives tale or made up but i have heard that shops have lost a customer tries to come back with something bad happened with their car i just had it to so and so and yeah it's documented and they signed it that we said the brakes were horrific And they came and picked up the car and drove it away. It's like, well, you must have thought it was good enough for them to drive away. Therefore. Yes. So Alicia, like, what's the threshold for that? I'm just trying to see. I don't know enough about planes. I'm trying to think of something that could need to be done, but doesn't really affect the drivability or safety. Drivability. That's funny. Flyability or safety. For example, the pilot seats have the rubber bands under them, right? If you find during an annual inspection... The rubber bands are extremely frayed. They have to be replaced. They're out of specification, whatever you want to call it. Is it an option for them to say, I don't want the rubber bands, just put it back together. I'm going to fly it out of here. Yeah, they have to put the rubber bands under the seat, which that plane can fly from here till the cows come home with a pilot that's got a halfway decent head on his shoulder without those rubber band supports under the seat, right? But as soon as I, the mechanic, find them and see that they're frayed, then it becomes my liability if something happens to the aircraft. Even though that might not have caused the plane going down, it would still be one of the responsibilities. You're opening yourself up to investigation. Because if you let that go, what else did you let go? So you can literally ground an airplane over rubber bands under the pilot's seat being frayed even a light being out the plane is automatically grounded oh yeah what a great i forgot they have lights on them oh my gosh i'm such a dummy because then it's a safety issue of not being seen in the air by another aircraft gotcha a light bulb out they can't they don't even have the ability to decline a light bulb replacement nope they can decline it if they don't want to pay for it that's fine it's just you guys will push it outside and they'll sit there and charge storage i suppose and Correct. Yep. Won't be able to leave the ground. She says, hey, man, hangar space is not cheap over there. That's what I heard. (laughs) No, it's not. I heard they pay a premium for hangar space. 
Alicia's company owns all those hangers over there, don't they? They rent them out to other people? We do. <laughs> if you don't have the money, then you're parking outside, buddy. So do you have to carry your own liability insurance or is that kind of through the company or maybe your specific job now isn't so much like that, but if you're working for like that FBO and there's a liability to you doing something, do they have to carry their own type of uh, insurance? Yes, actually, it's highly recommended to carry your own insurance. If you are a private A&P mechanic going around working on other aircrafts, luckily, I work under my company, so they would protect me to a point. You start to get into tricky situations when upper management starts forcing you to sign off on things that is not ready to be signed off on. Then it's one of those, well, you should have your own defense. However, they're supposed to protect you, not guaranteeing they'll protect you because low man on the totem pole, somebody's going to pay for the problem. Somebody's getting hung. When the airplane goes down, somebody's getting hung out to dry. And it's usually the person that had the wrench in their hand. Right. Or the pilot. That, that's the only two people that are getting hung out to dry. The person that was flying it, the person that was driving, or the person that worked on it. God, could you even imagine in our, our world? I, I, could you even imagine? Could you imagine if every time a wheel fell off or a bolt fell out of something, somebody had to go to trial? Yeah. <laughs> Anything that caused like damage. Whoever touched it or whoever signed off on it is the most liable. That would be, sure it happens in certain specific cases, but it's not common for all the accidents that go on. It, it's pretty rare that I've, I hear about this. It's more so disgruntled customers taking shops to court, not any kind of a negligence. And it probably would be so easy to prove. The burden of proof is going to be most likely on the tech. And now it's nothing's documented. I'm just thinking with all these ADAS systems, all the alignments that are done without the proper. First thing, the fact that they didn't do it, that's that's enough because I people, how much does it actually affect it? The, the one thing I do know is that I don't know how much it actually affected it. So this is what we have to do. But could you, nobody's, it's fair to say 90% or more, I think 90 might be being friendly. I think the correct number could probably be 99%. 99% of shops in our industry are not doing alignments properly per the service manual. Model year 2023 vehicles. And every alignment system probably warns and they just click right by it. Smash the button. Been there, done that. And then have the audacity, and I'm not kidding you, they have the audacity to demonize the shop that's trying to do it the right way. Yeah, because it's more money because the guy's got to spend an hour doing it. Yeah. What do you mean the wheel alignment's $300? Or what do you have to do? Well, we have to set the toe affected thrust angle or whatever, and now we have to do a... Yeah. I got to aim your windshield camera, redo, reset your steering angle sensor and X, Y, Z, right? Yeah, you don't need to do that. It'll be, we'll test drive it, make sure it works right. They're just trying to take you for a few hundred bucks. That's what they do down there. They're expensive. That's why they got a big waiting room. <laughs> take suckers like you, take advantage of you guys. God, I hate that. The worst part is half the time that comes from the service writer at the dealer, but that's a subject for another podcast. <laughs> we can't get into that right now. <laughs> How about like ongoing training? Is it fairly forced or by the company or by just the nature of what you do that it's expected or forced that you're continually getting trained on just the systems you're working on or different systems coming down the pipe? Uh, with my company, no. However, the FAA offers classes that you can sign up for and you get a point system that will help you get better jobs and they keep track of what you've learned and what areas that you would be better off. It would also help down the line with getting better jobs in different companies. So are you like a member of the FAA? Does, does, does a portion of your salary go towards funding that or who funds the those classes or do you have to pay for those classes? No, it's all paid for by the federal government. It's one of those things that get paid for with the money that we took the test with and it goes into 
bettering the system and getting stuff set up to keep us growing in the field. Interesting. Something that we missed, that I missed because I know about it, the testing, Alicia. There's a general written test, right? You do a paper test. I specifically remember not long after we were married, you had to go out to Elmira or Binghamton or something like that. Actually, on the other side of Rochester. That's right. You had to take a practical exam where she actually had to work on an airplane while somebody watched her work on an airplane. You don't just get to write the tests in. You actually have to. And then there's the practical where they watched you do some things and made sure that you were doing them properly. And then part of that was a verbal where they would ask you questions about what you were doing and why you were doing it while you were doing it. Is, is that accurate, Alicia? Correct. There's three portions of the test. You have the written, which is a multiple question test. You get a question with three answers to choose from. I believe for, it's been a while since I've taken the test. So I'm pretty sure it was a hundred for power plan, 100 for airframe, and I think it was between 50 to 75 for general. Would you say these are difficult questions? Some of them are, and then there's easier ones that's a no-brainer. But these tests with the written, you can buy a book that gives you every question that you can possibly be asked with the correct answer. Our instructor said, here are the books, learn them, memorize them inside and out. Now, a lot of them learned in the classes wow. that we've done. <laughs> so, All the crap I have to listen to and read about ASC tests. And here it is, the FAA's basically saying, here's the answer book, memorize. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm so happy she brought test up because as soon as she did, the little light bulb went off in my head. My eyes started twitching. And then you have the oral and practical, which again, that stuff you have to know. You don't have an answer book for it. The questions that they'll ask you, usually you'll go in an office, they'll sit down, they'll ask you three questions. You have to answer them. Like, how do you change the tire on this aircraft? And then you would... Very carefully. <laughs> next. Per service info. Next. That's more or less of <laughs> in accordance with... Brian and I, were like two-thirds of the way there. We would ace this oral thing. I'm pretty sure I helped Alicia study for the air, the climate control portion of her written exam. I'm pretty sure I helped her. Didn't I help you with the air conditioning or something? Weren't you having trouble understanding how that worked? And I had to draw yes. a stupid diagram. I drew a stupid diagram on a napkin to explain to her how the air conditioning worked. Yeah, that was <laughs> one system I've never been good with. <laughs> Neither has anybody else at your place, seeing as how the plane didn't take off because the heat didn't <laughs> it work. It doesn't throw heat. <laughs> Maybe it's not just you. Maybe the system just sucks that much. <laughs> And then you'll, when you go for the practical, have you safety wire some stuff, they'll have you put on a... Safety wire, like bailing wire? That's what we would call that. Yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> I was going to say, I've never heard it called that, but... <laughs> it's the same thing-ish. <laughs> I'm sure it's the same. <laughs> Mostly-ish. <laughs> Yeah, it's nothing like it. Actually, they have very specific. It's funny because we make we make fun of it because we call it because Matt and I both grew up in rural communities. So we're like, oh, yeah, bailing wire. But they have like standards for twists per inch when they're safety wiring stuff. Like it's not all rinky dink like we think it is. Yeah, you're supposed to have five twists per inch. <laughs> God, I think we might do that for network wires, twisted pairs. There might be a spec. Oh, and then and then you've got to have different sizes of safety wiring depending on what's being safety wired. Back to the testing. This is a hot button <laughs> subject, Alicia. She's not clued in of many things in the auto repair industry that I complain about and talk about. She has not been clued in to the latest in the ASE automotive fiasco, which seems to be unfolding online where ASC and the testing is the enemy because anybody can pass it because all you have to do is study for it. And meanwhile, there's tens of thousands of planes flying over our head right now where people just read, memorize the study guide. However, we do have to have so many hours of class time. I can sleep. You're supposed to have two years in the field. Yeah. Isn't that interesting, Matt? 
It's fascinating. There is a huge difference. She had to go pass a practical exam. There's no amount of memorizing and studying that gets you through a practical. I do think that it's interesting that for the written portion, that's the solution that is taught is here's the books, read them, memorize them. There's something to be said for having certain pieces of information memorized. Absolutely. Right. There's over 700 questions per (laughs) subject. So it's not like anybody can just memorize it in two days either. Do you feel like the questions are written by engineers or by people who are in the field? You get some of both. You have some that are written by the engineers and you have some that are written from people in the field. Is that how those tests are developed, Alicia? Is that literally how it is? Like there's people sit around on a meeting and basically make up those questions and some are actually aircraft mechanics in the field. Do you feel like that's probably how it is? Yeah, I'd assume that's how they do it. Is there practical tests on every system? Like, see, I think that's part of the misunderstanding is like there's practical tests for brakes. There's a practical test for engines, fuel systems. Air conditioning. Yeah, hydraulics. Yeah, HVAC. No, like you'll have airframe where they might have you do some riveting of sheet metal and engines. They'll probably have you put on different gas lines or change a carburetor. Like the general, again, would be the safety wiring, torquing of bolts. While you're doing this, you also have to be documenting as you go. And that is another part of the testing is making sure you're documenting correctly. You're pulling up the manual and doing it step by step the way you're supposed to. So there's different things, so many things they'll ask you within the airframe system or the power plant system that you'll need to know offhand. What I'm hearing is this auto repair industry has got to step up its game because that is what's holding us back is the lack of practical testing. 100%. What everybody's got in mind is what's going on clearly isn't what's going on. Practical testing, which I've been screaming for like five years now. Just make a (laughs) practical test. Make it so... If you want to do this, you got to be able to do whatever, however you want to break it down. I'm not going to be the guy in charge of it, but practical testing is what's going to not classroom and in the trade school and you get X amount of credits or whatever. No, actual practical testing. That's what needs to happen. And that's the difference between what they do and what we do. She had to go take the paper test, which was great. At least there's some barrier of entry. Somebody's got to give a crap enough to study all those questions, whether that holds any water as far as actual knowledge or not that's to be argued but the practical testing is where the rubber meets the road you can't memorize the answers to your practical test especially when you went into that practical alicia i remember you didn't know what you were going to be doing when you got there okay you're coming for your practical they don't tell you what you're working on you get there and they have tasks that you have to perform and you have no idea what they were going to be when you get there this is the endeavor and we need you to Put on a ceramic tile. Here's the space shuttle, which is super interesting. The idea of practical testing, the idea of blind practical testing, not knowing what you're going to have to do when you get there to further prove that you have understanding of multiple systems. It's just an interesting concept. That's why it's also testing if you can read and write the English language as well, because each component or whatever they're having you do They don't expect you to know how to do it offhand. So that's why you have the maintenance manual to walk you step by step that you're doing it correctly. And they just want to make sure that you can follow it. That's how they became mechanics. Yeah. It's because they didn't read good. (laughs) (laughs) Aircraft mechanics, it's spelling. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) The little paperclip on Microsoft Word's losing his mind the entire time they're typing. (laughs) He's just coming apart. There's a loud tapping like garden gnome hitting the back of the dash or the instrument panel with a hammer. And then the documentation was took hammer away from garden gnome. It's definitely interesting, especially that that whole testing situation has always fascinated me more so recently with conversations in the automotive industry, how paper testing is essentially stupid. Apparently it's just so interesting that that's the approach to 
an industry that's often recognized as more regulated, more standardized, and simply better than we are because of those things, the paper testing has literally the same approach. If not arguably worse, because the study guides, there's no ASE sanctioned study guides. Are they not ASE sanctioned? As far as I know, there's none. Motor Age or whoever has theirs and Mitchell had theirs for a while. Oh, you know what? You're right. Those are Alicia in the bedroom. Alicia's in up in the closet. There's a set of eight of them that are probably 20 years old. But I bet you you're right, man. I bet they're Motor Age or some third party. So there's no real answer key. And really, everyone is just scared of the Tech A, Tech B. So do they have that on your test? Do they have Aircraft Mechanic A, Aircraft Mechanic B or discussing? None of the above or? Yeah. They have tech A and tech B. This continues to get more interesting. Look at Matt's gears are just turning. I know, right? (laughs) We're an hour and a half deep into this and now. (laughs) I'm going to get yelled at. Sorry, Tracy. I'm definitely thinking there's a part two. Yeah, we could talk for hours about the testing. Or for like hot shots, part duh. We should do a part two. This has been fascinating. I am glad we did this. Glad you could come on. Yeah, hopefully you'd be interested in coming on again. Go down this rabbit hole some more. (laughs) Yes, I'd love to. Maybe then you can officially reveal that you guys are developing the SR-72. The SR-72. Hyperspace flight. I don't think they are. I mean, they have really cool company picnics and t-shirts, but I don't know if they have any military stuff going on over there. You know, did is fly fast and take pictures. Currently, no. You know what that means? So you're saying there's a chance. (laughs) There's been talk, but... (laughs) So you're saying there's a chance. Am I hearing Mach 6? Yes. (laughs) If you notice some booms, I think we're on to something. We may have broke this. (laughs) I don't know if I ever remember what they called it in Maverick. I don't know. Alicia doesn't watch Top Gun. Oh, don't say that. I'll be kissed. No. (laughs) When she was in school, that's all that people watched was Top Gun. And so one day I'm sitting around the house and we're like looking for a movie to watch. I'm like, oh man, Top Gun's on Netflix. She's absolutely not i'm like what are you talking about i am not watching top gun iron eagle it is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well thank you very very much for coming on and hope we can do this again soon delve into this a little bit more thank you everyone for listening thank you to nap auto tech training for sponsoring and thank you to aftermarket radio network and tracy for cleaning this all up making it sound like brian and i are halfway fluent with the english language We already know Alicia is. Man, thank you guys for coming on. And we'll talk to you later. Awesome. Thank you. You've been listening to Matt Fonslow diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z on the Aftermarket Radio Network. Follow Matt on your favorite listening app. He's very interested in what you have to say. Let him know what you'd like him to cover and come on the show. Matt is all for advancing the aftermarket. Find Matt Fonslow on social media and connect or on aftermarketradionetwork.com.